Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Aisha and I am one of your Solid State Circuit Society staff members. The topic of today's webinar for Young Excellence is Effective Technical Presentations, the How-To Guide, presented by Danielle Griffin. Today's webinar will be about an hour and we'll hold a Q&A session in, at the end of the webinar. Attendees of this webinar have the opportunity to earn a certificate of participation for attending this webinar. I will put a link in the chat box with instructions on how to obtain the certificate. The webinar video will be posted on the SSDS YouTube channel after the webinar. Please use the Q&A section on your dashboard to ask any questions. I now invite SSCS webinars for Young Excellence Committee member Divya to introduce our speaker and give a few welcoming remarks. Uh, hello and welcome. I'm Divya Akela. I'm, I'm a senior architect at NVIDIA based in Austin, Texas, uh, and an IEEE SSCS uh, Young Professionals Committee member. Uh, so I'll be the moderator of this webinar today. Before we kick off this uh, panel discussion, I will start with a small introduction of who we are and what we do. Um, as young professionals and students, uh, you make up more than 30% of our overall memberships and you're the future of IEEE SSAS. As uh, the SSES Professionals Committee, we strive to address the different needs and interests of our younger members. Uh, with initiatives like this uh, webinar series. Uh, select benefits of the SSES membership for young professional members include the following. Uh, access to the SSES Resource Center, which contain technical tutorials, short courses, and webinars, uh, distinguished lecture, lectures in your local setting, opportunities to apply for various uh, uh, grants and awards, develop leadership, uh, leadership skills and professional connections by becoming a local or global uh, young professional leader, and SSES Young Professional Network events at various conferences uh, like ISSCC, CICC, VLSI, and so on. We also offer an online mentoring platform that helps you connect with mentors all around the world virtually. Um, on upcoming events, I wanted to remind you all to save the date uh, for a Young Professionals and Women in Circuits mentoring event at CICC on April 23rd, so st stay tuned for that. Um, since 2020, uh, we have hosted webinars for Young Excellence, which is a quarterly webinar series uh, dedicated to, but not limited to, young professional members. Uh, currently, there are seven committee members uh, who operate this webinar, and this webinar series complements the monthly technical um, webinars, which also focus on technical developments. The list of webinars we did uh, uh, in the past are shown here, and these are also available at the SSCS uh, YouTube channel. So, without further ado, um, okay, go to the next slide. Without further ado, uh, today is part of the webinar series. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Danielle Griffith, and she will be speaking on effective technical presentations, uh, the how-to guide. Danielle is a fellow uh, at uh, Texas Instruments uh, in Dallas, Texas. She's responsible for the system architecture of next-gen low-power wireless connectivity SOCs. Her current focus areas are circuits and architectures for efficient wireless systems, low power oscillators, and MEMS circuitry. She's per published two book chapters and greater um, more than 70 papers and holds 23 issued US patents. Uh, she's given numerous IEEE conference plenary talks, tutorials, workshop, workshop sessions. She's been a TPC member on various IEEE conferences and a senior member of the IEEE. Uh, she was also associate editor of the GSSEC uh, journal and a distinguished lecturer at SSCS. And today we will hear about um, how technical knowledge alone is not key to success and how very crucial communication and presentation skills are, uh, are too. Uh, so this talk will help all of us in becoming better speakers, whether it be at a conference or if you're pitching exciting new ideas to your colleagues. So welcome, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Um, we are 
very excited to learn from you. I'll go ahead and unshare my slides so, so you can share them. Thanks. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, so my title of my presentation today is uh, Effective Technical Presentations, uh, the How-To Guide. So the outline of my talk is as follows. First, I'm going to go through the motivation, you know, why you're here today, and then the steps of a technical presentation, which include planning, preparation, practice, and then the presentation itself. And then after that, uh, I will have the uh, summary uh, conclusions. And uh, at the end, I have some resources for you. So first, uh, why attend this session? So your success in life is determined by your ability to speak, your ability to write, and the quality of your ideas in that order. So this is a quote that I really like from Dr. Patrick Winston, uh, who was the director of the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. And it comes from his lecture, How to Speak. Uh, this is available on YouTube and I have a link to it uh, at the end of the talk. So why attend the session? You've spent years at university honing your technical skills, but this alone is not enough. You're not going to ensure your success just with your technical skills. You need to be able to express your ideas clearly so that others can see their value. So by the end of this session, you will have understood the importance of knowing your audience. You will have seen examples of good and bad presentations. You will have learned how to get the feedback you need as you're preparing your presentation. Uh, you will have picked up some ideas, I hope, on how to improve, improve the delivery of your presentation. And you will have heard tips that you can pick from to develop your own personal presentation style. And most importantly, you will have taken that first step towards really improving your presentation skills. So over to the right is a picture of the IEEE International Solid State Circuits Conference audience. So if you're in an IC design role, this is the top conference that you will present at someday, uh, if you haven't already. If you're in other roles, there's surely other conferences that you may end up at uh, with equally big audiences um, and equally high profile. Uh, so this presentation is focused on training you and preparing you for this sort of career defining presentation that you'll give someday. But really, I would argue that what we're going to talk about, it's applicable to all sorts of different technical presentations you're going to do in the course of your career. In other words, if you can clearly and persuasively present your ideas in front of an audience of 3,000 strangers, you can certainly do it effectively to your department manager or your research group. And in case you're thinking that you don't actually give that many technical presentations and you're not sure why you signed up for this class, I would argue that if you are in a technical role, you are going to be giving technical presentations, even if they're small and less formal. Maybe it starts simply as a design review or explaining your ideas to your manager or your coworkers or your thesis advisor. So let's dive right in. The first step is planning. So when you plan your presentation, the very first thing you want to do is to have it very clear in your head what one to two sentences there are that describe your key idea. So in my role over the last 10 years, I've been involved in the development of a completely new technology at Texas Instruments that no other company had commercialized called the Bulk Acoustic Wave Oscillator. So throughout this training session, I'm going to use this project as an example of point. So for me, my one to two sentence summary idea is, Texas Instruments is the first company to bring bulk acoustic wave oscillators to production, which replaced the crystal oscillator, a hundred year old technology. Innovation in process design and packaging has enabled customers to design products that are smaller, lower cost, and more robust while simultaneously achieving better performance. So once you know what your key idea is, 
is, and you can very clearly enunciate it, you want to tell a story around this idea. You want to show what is the problem you're trying to solve, why is the problem important, the steps you took to solve the problem, why those steps work, and then also importantly, how is your idea different than others? Professor Winston describes this as building a fence around your idea. How is it different, more advanced, uh, and an improvement from anything else that's been done before? And also you want to simplify. So the important point is that simplify your summary such that your message is very clear. Strip out anything that doesn't directly support the story you are telling. The second step of planning is knowing your target audience. So for my example, my project, one of my abstracts is a temperature compensated ball based crystal oscillator achieves better than 30 parts per million frequency stability, including all environmental effects. It achieves 4x better shock immunity than a crystal oscillator. That makes it the first ball oscillator to meet the Internet of Things frequency reference requirements in volume production. That's one abstract. Another abstract I've used is breakthrough products built on bulk acoustic wave MEMS resonators have been developed through cross-domain innovation. The CC2652RB is the world's first wall-based technology, which allows customers to build their PCBs without crystals, reducing the form factor and simplifying their supply chain. So here you see, I've got two different 40 word abstracts about exactly the same project and exactly the same product. But it's obvious that one is a summary for a technical versus a business audience, two different, um, two different uh, focuses of the same uh, talk. And it should be obvious that one is for one and one is the other. Um, yet I've seen extremely detailed technical presentations being given when the business focused one is really the one that was that should have been done. So the mismatch between topic and audience can be less severe than this, but it can still detract from how effective your presentation could be. So you need to think about how much background your audience needs to understand your concept and what you want them to learn from your presentation. Are you telling them the business side, the technical side, the low level technical details or a high level picture? And then you could also imagine, how would I have to change my summaries above if I was targeting this for a university recruiting situation? Then I would need a background that described it in a way that a university student would understand and it would have a focus on my company's strengths and how innovation was, in, is, was involved. So, so the first part then is remember understanding your target audience. Who are you giving this presentation to and what do you want them to get out of it? So the next step is the preparation. First, the introduction. Don't skip it. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many times I've seen presentations where the engineer stands up and dives right into the nitty gritty details of the design without spending two minutes to say, what's this design for? Why do I care? Why do you, the audience care? Um, and what the background of it is. So don't skip your introduction. Also, as a part of your introduction, start with an empowerment promise. So my empowerment promise is at the end of this talk, you will understand what a ball resonator is, how it's an improvement over the 100 year old crystal technology, and how TI's unique combination of process design technology have enabled its development. So I'm telling the audience what they're going to learn out of my presentation and why they should pay attention to me uh, throughout the rest of the talk. You also want to describe the background of the talk. And for this, again, you need to know your audience. The background doesn't have to be long or complicated and spending even just one or two minutes to put your idea into context can determine whether your audience understands the purpose of your presentation or if you've lost them before you even start talking. So my 
in my uh, background would be nearly all electronic circuitry requires a clock. If an accurate clock, clock is required, it's often generated with a crystal oscillator, which was invented 100 years ago. So it's fairly common for the technical presenters to just jump over the background. They think that everyone else probably understands the problem as well as they do. Um, but really, that's typically true for only a few people in the audience. We're all working in such different fields, and it's so complex and so technical that not everybody understands the details of what you're doing. And you want them to understand the motivation. Is your motivation to lower cost, improve reliability, improve performance, uh, reduce the power? And so once you've expressed what the motivation is, you can refer back to it throughout your talk, showing how every part of your work builds on that motivation and solves the problem that you're trying to describe. So if you don't describe the motivation in your beginning, your audience could just sit through the whole presentation rather than paying attention to you trying to understand the motivation. Like, why is, why is the presenter doing this? Why, what's the purpose of this project? So my motivation could be, despite billions of crystal oscillators being manufactured every year, they have significant drawbacks, including large size, high cost and sensitivity to environmental changes. So we want to improve that. So the first five minutes of your talk are crucial. If you don't explain to your audience the background of your work and the motivation, why did you do it? You will have lost them before you even reach the body of your talk. The next part to consider in the preparation is the visual look of your slides. You want to choose the slide title wisely to maximize the information. I actually recently reviewed a tutorial slide set for a conference that had 20 slides in a row, all with exactly the same title, and only the figures on each page were different. So without hearing the presenter speak as I was reviewing it, I couldn't understand what's the point of these slides, because what am I trying to learn from each one? So in my case, uh, that would be like saying that each title of each slide is oscillator design, one of three, two of three, three of three, when instead I could label them something like existing architecture limitations, improve phase noise, uh, remaining startup issue. You also surely have heard you want to make your fonts large, but I would also argue you want to make them consistent. If you make the fonts consistent throughout the slides, they're less distracting and people can then concentrate on the message you're trying to give and not how your slides look. Most of your slides should also have an image and some concise text on it. You don't want a slide that's all image or all text. You want the text to describe the image and make the point clear uh, of what you're trying to say. Use high quality images. Over to the right of this slide on the top, I have a snapshot of a schematic of an oscillator. And on the bottom, I have a Visio drawing of effectively the same oscillator. You can imagine that the audience is going to understand the bottom one much more easily than they would the top one. So yes, it takes a little more time, but it's absolutely worth doing. Spend some effort on your quality quality of your images so that, you're, that your audience will understand it. You want to keep your images simple and eliminate clutter. This slide was actually shown in a design review, actually slightly more complicated than this. I've simplified it a bit. Um, so if you already understand this circuit, you'll understand the slide, and then why are you in the presentation? But if you don't understand this circuit, the slide is not going to explain it to you. So you can see that the slide it has no title, so it's not clear what the main point is. The font is small and varied, so the audience can't read it or understand it. So if this was the slide you were going to present, it needs to be separated out into several different pages, each with a different issue highlighted or different point highlighted rather than trying to uh, include everything all on one slide. This image here, it's approximately the same circuit as shown on the previous page, but it's been simplified. And the main point in the end 
is that the frequency of this oscillator is equal to a function of resistors capacitors. And that equation is just listed there in a red box. Very obvious what the point here is. Everything not necessary to make that point has been removed from the figure. So when I'm preparing a presentation, when I think I'm done, I go back to the beginning and look through and see if there's any details in the figures that uh, I didn't end up discussing. And if so, I delete them. I wanna make things as clear as possible so that the audience focuses on exactly the message I'm trying to give them and doesn't get distracted thinking about something else that's not relevant. So if you've got something on the slide that's not critical to understand the concept, then just remove it. The next step in preparation is thinking about the time. First, you need to budget the preparation time. It's unfortunately more than you think for the big events if you haven't done them before. So my general rule of thumb is what behind each one minute of presentation time, I need to allocate five minutes to, to uh, plan the slide. What do I wanna say on this slide? What's the main point going to be? 10 minutes to find the data. This is assuming I have already been in the lab. I've already taken the data. I have it somewhere. I have to find it. What's the right data to make my point? I probably need a figure, so let's allocate 30 minutes to draw the figure uh, nicely and clearly so that it can be understood. Five to 10 minutes to write simple, clear text to summarize the main point that I want to make. Of course, if I want to make more text and less clear, I could do this faster, but that's not the goal. And then I need three to five minutes to practice the delivery. In other words, I'm going to practice the presentation for the big career defining event allowed three to five times in advance. If you add this all up, it means that you need to allocate one hour preparation time per one minute of presentation time. And if you look at this, you think this is just like not, it's, I can't do this. Think about it though. If you are giving an ISSCC talk, that's the talk where somebody's going to come up to you afterwards and say, your talk was brilliant. You are exactly the person we want to hire for this new role to lead your dream job. Then suddenly one hour per one minute is totally okay if it opens up a completely new chapter in your life, in your career, and it's exactly what you wanted. So for the big events, allocate this much and it will pay off. Also, in the context of time, you want to allocate one to two minutes of speaking time per slide, but it's good to have something on the slide change at least every 60 seconds to keep your audience engaged. So they're not just listening to you talk and talk and talk with nothing, nothing changing. On the other hand, don't go overboard with the animation. There's no reason to have images fly in from the side rather than just hearing at the right moment. Next, in preparation, you need to consider the conclusions. Also, don't skip the conclusion. The conclusion might be totally clear to you, but let's make sure it is clear to the audience too. And in the conclusions, you want your final slide to be summarizing your contribution. What have you done to advance the state of the art? My example could be the Baugh oscillator achieves 3 dB better figure of merit than the nearest competitor at a one kilohertz offset. I've removed the crystal, so I save 15% in the PCB area. Uh, the fast startup time reduces the average power consumption by uh, 10%. So the point is, I'm making the, I'm showing that the design has improved the figure of merit, saved size and cost and it saved power, summarizing my contributions. Also in your conclusions, you can include what's next. What are, and this gives your audience opportunities for engagement. Maybe we can explore applications for lower frequency resonators in my case. I could brainstorm with audience members about options for further power reduction. Something to show where is your work going next. And now the third section is 
practice. Uh, as a part of your practice, you will want to have your slides reviewed. I know it's most comfortable and easiest just to ask your immediate coworkers to review your slides. But honestly, they're not the best source of feedback for you. They already know what you're doing, I hope. They already know what problem you're trying to solve and they already know why it matters. Instead, or in addition, you need to ask for review from people who have the same background as your intended audience. If you're presenting to the business audience uh, to try to get funding for a new or support for a new project, get review by someone from that background to make sure they understand what you're saying. Um, or if you're presenting to someone who has a different IC background than you do, analog versus digital versus RF or whatever it might be, have them review, have some people like that review in advance. So this benefits you because you'll get to see your presentation through someone else's eyes and you'll see what might be obvious to you, but your audience is unfamiliar with. And acronyms are a prime example for us for this. Uh, in slide review one time, I got the feedback that the acronym PPB was unfamiliar. And to me, this was like kind of shock, shocking because I'm thinking parts per billion. This is something who's working with, this is something that people who are working with frequency references and stability and accuracy, they use it daily. But that's not necessarily true for everyone else. So that's a good example of just why you need to have your slides reviewed. Also, you need to, as a part of practice, understand how much time you have. Is it a firm time limit? Um, can you have some variability in your talk length? If you don't have your talk end at the right time, it shows you haven't practiced it enough. Maybe it was too short, maybe it was too long, you haven't thought it through and spent enough time to make sure it matches the presentation uh, environment. So one rule of thumb that I use is that a native English speaker can speak up to 140 words per minute. So one option you can do is write a script for a few of your slides, maybe the more complex ones, and see if they fit in the time budget. So another way to think about this is if you've made a slide and you can't write 300 words to completely, clearly, and exactly explain that slide, it's too complicated. You can't explain it in two minutes. You need to simplify it. You need to remove something. You need to break it up into pieces uh, to simplify it so that your audience will understand your message, even with their diverse backgrounds. Next, as a part of practice, you need to practice aloud. It is not sufficient for the important talks to just kind of flip through your slides on your computer, going through in your mind what you will say. We're all far more fluent in our heads than we are when we try to speak aloud, especially if English is not your native language. Um, if it's a low key event, maybe practicing aloud once is sufficient. If it's ISSCC or something similar, really I recommend spending the time to go to, through it at least three times aloud with an audience if you can, by yourself if you can't get them. It's worth the investment. Another thing that you should think about when you're doing your practice is memorizing the transition between the slides. Um, you're probably going to give your talk freely. I mean, you're not reading a script, but um, you can seize up. You're most likely to lose your train of thought when you transition from one slide to the other. So if you memorize the first sentence you will say for each slide, you will smoothly flow from one slide to the next and your presentation will go much better for you. To help you with this, you can add notes at the, in the PowerPoint presenter view uh, to get you started on each slide, even if it's just a few words, uh, but maybe they're not visible to you during the event. So in that case, you would need to memorize it. The point is you don't want to be surprised when the next slide appears. Maybe you were talking about one topic and then it moves to the next topic. And when you first see the slide, you don't remember exactly what you were going to say and you kind of like stall. 
So uh, memorizing the transitions will help with that. And that brings us to the final section, which is the presentation itself. You've done all the work of planning, the preparation, and the practicing, and now the big day is here. So first, your presentation could be either virtual or in person. So if it's virtual, you absolutely want to test out your sharing and your camera setup in advance. So this uh, picture here is an example of one way I have mine set up in my office. Uh, here I, you can see the camera under the red dot. And I, you want to arrange your setup uh, so that you are looking more or less directly at the camera or that the camera is slightly above you. You don't want to have the camera like shooting up at your face. It's just not as good of an approach. Um, I share one screen if it's in the PowerPoint presenter view. Uh, but then my field of view is set up so that I'm looking towards the camera as I'm presenting. This allows me to see my notes if there's anything that I've written down to remember that I want to say about a particular slide. Uh, and it also shows me the ability uh, to have the chat if there's going to be a live question and answer uh, session that I want to be able to see. Uh, so set this up ahead of time and test it out uh, so you know what it looks like and you're not uh, fumbling around the day of the presentation. Of course, use a headset or some sort of high quality microphone. Um, you want people to be able to hear your ideas and you can consider a virtual background if you think it will be necessary to reduce the distraction. So your setup, of course, could look very much different than mine. But the point is you want to test it all out ahead of time so that you know how it will look and that uh, you will not distract your audience from the way it is. You want them to notice your technical uh, talk. Your presentation could also be in person. So if it is in person, in, a, in advance, you want to become familiar with the logistics. This includes the microphone. It could be wired, it could be wireless, or it could be a podium mic. And you want to also know how to change the slides. This seems kind of obvious, but it's so common to see a presenter get up uh, and get ready to go and still have to spend several minutes being unable to change the slides. Uh, and that just takes time away from you being able to share your talk and your ideas with the audience. So in this picture here, this is a, a picture of me uh, from a talk in Ireland uh, about a year and a half ago. And in this case, uh, it's a typical setup where I'm facing forwards to the audience and the audience is seeing a large screen behind me. Um, so the audience sees the slides and me but I'm looking forwards always so that I am making eye contact with the audience. But then there's also a monitor down low that I can see so I can see my slides so that I know what I'm talking about. I know what the audience is seeing. So this is the same way that ISSCC is set up. Uh, and the point of this is that the presenter then is always facing the audience and keeping eye contact so that you realize how engaged you are with your audience or not. Um, you understand by their body language if they're following your talk. You can figure out if you're going too fast or too slow. Um, and maybe you can tell by their body language if they're following you, if you need to slow down or maybe spend a little bit more time on some topic. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that your notes, if you're using the PowerPoint presenter view, may not be visible to you in this case. This is, this is what happens at ISSCC. So if you don't get this checked out ahead of time, you have to be aware that you may not have any notes visible. So back on that, uh, what we talked about earlier, of making sure you know what the next slide is and the first sentence you're going to say so that it smooth, flows smoothly, this is a case where it's just even more important that you have to be prepared for this um, to make sure that whether or not you have notes, you can give your presentation smoothly. Then during the presentation itself, it's most important to show passion about the subject. You will want to avoid speaking in a monotone. Try not to talk too fast. 
and try not to go with absolutely no pauses. So Professor Winston described this as using verbal punctuation. This means you stress the important point or you pause briefly after you've made the important point. You also want to avoid jargon, slang, figures of speech as much as possible. We all know that audience members are going to have different native languages. The more jargon and slang you have, the less they will follow in your talk. And they're not going to get uh, the full benefit of your technical ideas. Also, give your audience multiple chances to understand an idea. You want to cycle around the idea. You can assume that 20% of the people are kind of in a fog at any given time. And if you make an important point once, and they weren't listening right that second because they just got a text or something, some other thought came into their mind, then you've lost them for the rest of the talk. So make your point and then make it again in a little bit different way later on. So if your point is that your new design has reduced cost, bring that up several times throughout the presentation to show how all of your design reduces cost or improves performance or whatever your main point is. Related to this, you want to occasionally say out the entire acronym meaning, not just the very first time when you introduce it. Maybe somebody walked into your presentation three minutes late and you had this really critical acronym that you explained in the first two minutes and then you never mention it again and you just say the acronym, but not the meaning, then the person who walked in three minutes late will not understand anything of your talk because they missed that part. So periodically say it out again so that they, and say the main point in different ways so that everyone has a chance to understand, even if they miss it the first time. Maintain eye contact with the audience. This is of course impossible to do through a virtual interface, but uh, definitely in person. You will see your audience leaning forward if they understand and if they're interested in what you're saying, you'll see them nodding, you'll see them taking notes. This is a huge positive boost when it happens. It is positive feedback. The audience is engaged and listening and they like your talk. Um, so your talk just gets better. It's just awesome when it happens. And then if it doesn't happen, it's a wake up call. So before it's too late, you can alter your presentation to help get your audience engaged. And if you're that person who's standing up at the front of the room with your back to your audience, because you're looking at the big screen that's supposed to be behind you instead of making eye contact with your audience, you're not even gonna notice this happens. So face your audience, make eye contact and pay attention to see if they're understanding what you're saying and then adapt accordingly. Next, during the presentation itself, uh, let's address the concept of dealing with stage fright. It's okay to be nervous, um, but preparation and rehearsal is the remedy to this. So once you get started on a slide, it's going to go smoothly, regardless of how nervous you are, if you've practiced it enough. So again, if you've memorized the slide transition or the first sentence you're going to say for a slide, then the rest of it will just follow afterwards smoothly. So between the slides is the most quite likely place to freeze due to stage fright. So practice your transitions. Another point in the presentation that people are very worried about is the question and answer period. And here it's good to remember that you don't have to have every answer to every possible question in your head. Nobody does. There's always some question that can stump somebody. But it's okay, just answer as well as you can and then offer to follow up or continue the conversation later if you don't have all the information you need right then. And then actually do follow up and your audience will really appreciate that. So that takes us to the conclusions. So the very main point of this presentation is that communication skills are critical to your success. Technical skills are not enough to get yourself noticed and advanced the way you would like. 
But the good news is that absolutely every one of you is capable of giving a fantastic presentation. All you need to do is remember the four steps. First, plan. Know who your target audience is and have a key message that you can explain in two sentences. Second, prepare. Simplify your slides and budget enough time for this. You are not going to make an excellent ISSCC presentation the night before. It will take you time, but on the other hand, that time is absolutely worth it. It will pay off in your career, I promise you. Third, practice. Plan on three to five times allowed for these really important career-defining presentations. And fourth, present. You will be fantastic after you check out the venue in advance, and then just show passion for your idea during the talk. And then after all of that hard work, you can enjoy the well-deserved applause. And so remember, this material was targeted towards the bigger, more important presentations you're going to make in your career. But the points can be adapted to a wide range of situations, uh, and you can use them to present your ideas to your boss or your department head or your thesis advisor, or maybe you have some internal conference where you're going to present. And so I hope you found some of these uh, points to be useful and that they can benefit you and lead to your, your career advancement. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, um, Daniel. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, this was uh, very thought provoking and I'm sure that the audience has uh, a lot of questions. Uh, so let's go on to the audience Q&A session. Um, so as a reminder uh, to the audience, please use the Q&A section on your dashboard uh, to ask any questions uh, that you have uh, uh, regarding the talk that you just heard. Uh, so yeah, let's go on to some of the questions. So the first question that we got is, um, please tell us about the importance of body language during presentations. And do you have any recommendations for practice that would uh, help improve in the area? Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of different styles of body languages. Uh, I've had, I've seen some presenters that stick purely behind a podium and they barely move, yet they still make a fantastically engaging uh, presentation that's really good. And then I've seen other presenters that pace vigorously from side to side, uh, and they're really good too. So I think that comes down to more your own personal style and you will develop it over time and practice. Um, I personally find I move a lot more when I'm practicing than I do during the actual presentation itself. I don't know why, um, but I, I think that's a personal thing. I think many different techniques can work uh, just based on your style. Um, yeah, I think one of the related questions that we got was like, do you recommend uh, walking on the stage during uh, a talk or <laughs> do you have to stay still? Yeah, yeah I, I think there, if you're walking on the stage, you have to be careful that you're still making eye contact with the audience and that you're not blocking your slides so that your audience can still see them. So you can do it, but you have to be careful that you're not making the experience worse for your audience. So as long as you're not blocking your sides, um, you make sure that your microphone quality is still good. You'd of course need a wireless mic to do this. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, can you elaborate on remembering the transitions uh, from your slides? So what are these transitions? Can you elaborate? Oh, more? sure. So if I have a slide, um, maybe I can come up with some example here. So say this was my first slide as, as an example. Um, if I haven't remembered the transition, when this first pops up, I might think, well, am I supposed to talk about logistics first, or am I supposed to talk about the figure first, or where do I start? So um, my 
for this particular slide, the first thing that I know I'm supposed to say is that I want to become familiar with the logistics in advance. I do not want to start describing the figure as an example. So just if you've got a slide that has a lot of things on it, you'll have image, you'll have text, know where are you starting? And that could be as simple as memorizing the first sentence you say, or memorizing which point in the slide we'll start with first. That makes sense. Um, so the next question is, um, so we might be inclined to overload uh, a presentation with a lot of technical contents so that, that we really want to present. So how do you recommend that we condense it down to the right amount for a given presentation? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's really hard because you've done amazing work. You've got some really cool idea. You've got a lot of really cool ideas and you wanna share all of them with your audience. But realistically, maybe your presentation slot is 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever, but you've worked for a year on your project. Um, and I think that's where it goes back to, if in the beginning you can write two sentences summarizing what it is you want to put, what's the important point, then build on that. So maybe you've got a lot of great ideas, but they don't fit in your two sentences. So only include the things that directly support your idea. And that is, I think, really the hardest part of it all is being able to focus down to exactly the, the strip it down to what's the key point here to explain so that anybody can understand what you've done and how important it is. Thank you. Um, the next question is, so do you think the information uh, content of the slides should be more during an online presentation because of the ever present audio issues? Or in general, do you think that the slides should be should differ in any way based on whether the presentation is online or offline or virtual? Oh, I think online or in person, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good, oh, good, good question. The way I try to make my slides is clear enough that if I'm sending them out to someone else afterwards, they wouldn't absolutely need my audio to still understand the main points. So maybe my audio has some details, some elaborations, but the main point is in the slides. So I don't make different versions of technical slides for virtual versus in-person presentations. Um, and so, but I still try to make my slides so that they have all of the main points included. Um, another question, uh, actually <laughs> quite a few questions uh, related to Q&A. So how do you approach uh, the non-practiced part of the uh, presentation and what are some techniques for handling questions or criticism? Or if someone finds a weakness of your idea during the presentation, like how do you deal with it? Uh, so. Yeah, and that can happen. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind is that probably every idea has some weakness, but also some strength. So you could try to ref uh, you could try to rephrase the point or or describe that yes, the weakness pointed out in your idea is true in some certain case, but your idea still has merit in this other case. So like if you get up and, and say, in my case, I've made this ball oscillator that's the absolute best thing ever and no one would ever use a crystal oscillator. Again, I would get torn apart because that's not true. So if somebody points out that yes, crystal oscillators are still better, I can agree with them and say, yes, you're right. They're still better in this particular case. And that sort of goes back to uh, Patrick, uh, Dr. Patrick Winston's point of you're making a fence around your idea of your idea is not the best thing for everything ever, but it's a really new and good thing in one particular area. 
So if you've defined where your idea is relevant, then even if somebody finds a weakness in it, it might be in a region or in an application that's not your main point. That's a great tip. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next question is, uh, so with a large audience uh, that may not have the relevant knowledge into the specific topics of the presentation, how much time do you devote to the introduction or explaining the background? So do you have any tips for that? Yeah, I, I think one of the hardest times to give a presentation is when you have a really varied audience. If you've got undergrad students all the way up to people with 20 years of experience in industry or something, then it's much harder to do. Um, you still have to get across your main point though. So I don't think you could spend more than maybe 20 or 30% of the time max as an introduction, because you still need to leave time uh, to make a point for the more senior people in your audience to understand. And I think I would look at it there as even if partway through your presentation, you lose some people in your audience because you're getting into some details that not everyone understands, at least they learn something in your introduction and your motivation. So maybe now they know about um, a, an application of some design or some space that they didn't even know existed before. So then everybody still gets something out of it if you do it like that. That makes sense. Oh, so would sup like supplementary slides be helpful in such situations? Oh yes, definitely. That's a good idea. If you if you know that you will be sharing your slides afterwards, that's great. I'm sure your audience would love that. Okay. That makes sense. Um Okay, another question is, is, is there a suitable uh, time or place for involving the audience in a technical presentation? Yes, okay, so sometimes technical presentations are set up so that you get audience questions in the middle of the talk. This is tricky if you don't have a moderator help it, helping you out because Depending on how the talk goes, you could get complete if you like if you stop in the middle to take some present to take some questions, you can get completely overwhelmed with questions and almost distractions off into like related but not exactly the same idea, so that you don't actually get to your main point. So if you do have it set up so that you have questions in the middle. You need to have a moderator involved and have it agreed ahead of time that will stop, say, for five minutes to get any clarification questions in the middle, but no more than that, because you don't want to get derailed and lose your time and never actually get to the detailed uh, technical content that shows all the fantastic work you've done. Makes sense. Um... Uh, the next question is, uh, what is the recommended rule of thumb in terms of timing uh, for a technical presentation? Um, is it like one minute for each slide? Yeah. Or if you should spend more time? It depends on your talk, of course, but I find um, for my hardcore technical talks, I'll use about one and a half minutes per slide. Um, and because if you go too slowly and you stay on the same, if you have exactly the same slide up for five minutes and you talk about it, some people are more visual learners than audio learners. Um, and so they will have looked at the same slide for five minutes, read through it, and they're not quite listening to you as much as they are reading the slide. And then they kind of drift away because you've not shown them anything new for five minutes. So. I find it works best if you spend probably no more than two minutes per slide. But if you've got a lot of things to talk about in a slide that's very similar, you can have like small changes on the slide from one to the next. So something is still changing visually, even though maybe it takes you 10 minutes to go through that topic and you spend two minutes per slide. 
and but you go through five slides, but they're not five identical slides. That's a great point. Um, the next question is, uh, what are some tips for when you present a poster instead of a slide? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think there you have to be even more careful that your main idea is very clearly presented in the slide because in a poster session, you can get surrounded by 10 or 15 or 20 people all at the same time if your talk, if your talk or your, your talk, but your poster is really interesting and you're only talking to one or two of them and the other you know, eight or 18 or whatever it is are crowding around only able to read um, your poster. So it's even more important in that case that your main point is very clear and very distilled down clearly with just the main point without too much distracting information so that the, uh, the audience can very quickly read and understand. And then if they have questions, they can ask you. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll do just one more question in the interest of time. Uh, so the last question for today is, uh, how much animation do you recommend beyond slides? Um, I don't use any more animation personally than what you saw in my slides today, where I'm just making a few more lines appear at a time. I know some people use more than this. Uh, I often find it distracting. Maybe that's a personal taste thing, um, but I would try not to go overboard with it so that people, unless it directly somehow supports the main idea you're trying to make. If you have, for instance, some EM simulation and you're wanting to show animation to show how waveforms change, great, that's a fantastic place to use it. You know, some uh, animation to show a technical concept, that's great. But I wouldn't add it just to make your slides look pretty. That makes sense. Um, okay, so thank you, uh, audience, for all your excellent questions, and thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Daniel, for uh, very insightful answers and uh, an excellent presentation uh, overall. So, on behalf of the organizing committee, um, we're concluding this uh, ses session today on this very important topic of technical presentation skills. Um, your suggestions will help us young uh, young professionals. Uh, navigate this very important topic and help them succeed. So thank you so much. Uh, as noted earlier, the recording of this webinar will be available at the SSES YouTube channel. And before you leave, please don't forget to complete our feedback survey. Uh, thank you and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.